Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Ivan Golden with uh, Han Lozier. Thanks for uh, joining us for uh, the second of three webinars that we are putting on, um, broadly speaking, on the topic of uh, relief that's available under uh, the CARES Act uh, for the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, I'm joined today by Suhas Shah, who is a partner and founder with uh, Intellis Advisors, which is a business consulting and accounting firm um, based in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, this is going to be, this is the, the second of three webinars. Um, I'd encourage everybody to join us next week if you're able. Um, we're going to be talking about the um, Main Street Lending Program that the Treasury and the Federal Reserve um, have announced. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, making the most of SBA loans and, and, in particular, making the most of Paycheck Protection Program loans. Um, we'll talk in just a minute and uh, throughout the session about some of the uncertainty that still exists and some of the new uh, guidance that has come out literally just in the past few hours. And so we're, this continues to be a very dynamic program with um, some of the guidance changing um, you know, very, very rapidly. A um, couple of housekeeping items. Um, I believe that all of the participants have been muted um, and will be muted for the duration of the program, just so we can kind of minimize background noise and, and that sort of thing. If you want to ask any questions at any point during the presentation, you can use the uh, chat feature in the software. It should come up. Uh, I think it's typically at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little chat bubble or the, the texting bubble on your phone. Um, feel free to utilize that to ask questions at any point, and we'll try to address them uh, as they come up. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and there should be access to um, the recording uh, as well as access to the slides that we're going to be going through probably in about uh, 24 hours, give or take, so you should have um, access to, you know, to the full recording of the presentation as well as the materials probably in about a day. Um, so with that, I'm going to start on the presentation um, and uh, look forward to, to talking about this with all of you. So as many of you probably know, um, Congress just within the past several days appropriated an additional $310 billion to the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, the initial allocation of $349 billion was um, uh, allocated and, and, and sort of all spoken for within less than two weeks. Um, and that, you know, obviously caused a lot of uh, anxiety for a lot of small businesses that were afraid they were going to be shut out of the program. We now have an additional $310 billion. Of that, $60 billion is specifically set aside for lending through community banks, uh, credit unions, and smaller institutions like that. Um, I, I can't um, speak to this directly, but I, I have read sort of anecdotally that even that $310 billion is likely, you know, substantially or even completely spoken for uh, in terms of, of uh, loan applications that were already in the pipeline when sort of the first tranche expired. So I think, um, and, and hopefully nobody who's participating in this webinar is in this situation, but I think, you know, for businesses that are considering applying, haven't yet applied, um, I would say you want to apply absolutely as quickly as possible because the funding in all likelihood is not going to last very much longer. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So I'm going to start by just talking about how can uh, PPP loan funds uh, be used. And if you want to go to the next slide, you'll see that there are only a handful of purposes for which uh, uh, the, the loans may be used. Um, and broadly speaking, it's payroll costs, mortgage interest, uh, rent payments, utility payments, interest on other debt that was occur incurred prior to February 15, and then refinancing of certain SBA economic injury disaster loans. Um, 
there was a misconception, I think, when these programs were announced that they were sort of an either or, that if you had an EIDL, you could not obtain um, a, uh, a PPP loan. The guidance has since clarified that you can have both loans, but you can't have two loans to be used for the same purpose. So if you have an EIDL loan um, for, for use uh, for payroll costs, um, then that's got to be refinanced into your, um, uh, into your PPP loan. I see there's a question about how to see the slides. Um, I don't know, uh, Aaron Hawk, our, uh, our marketing director is, is on, the, on the line. I don't know if, Aaron, you can respond to that in the chat or if there's, um, I suspect it's sort of a, an issue of how you view your, uh, there's different view options. Um, so I don't know if Aaron, you're able to respond either verbally or, or in the chat to that question. Yes, I've been um, already. Okay, if we can move to the next uh, slide then. Um, so the CARES Act itself, if you actually read the statute, it suggested that you could use PPP loan proceeds for, in addition to what I just talked about, that you could use them for other purposes for which SBA loans can be used generally. Um, however, the SBA has um, published an interim final rule, and on the app loan application itself, they say that loan proceeds can only be used for these purposes, and that is irrespective of forgiveness amount. So even if, and this is the case I know for, for certain borrowers, they may be less concerned about forgiveness and may have a misconception that they can use their loan amount, uh, you know, for any purpose, um, and that's, that is not the case. Even, even if you're not concerned about forgiveness, the SBA is saying that you may only use the loans for these permitted purposes. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, and then um, another rule, which I, I would suspect that many people are probably aware of at this point, is that at least 75% of loan proceeds have to be used for, um, for payroll costs. Um, I, I wanna ask a question actually to Suhas and get his input on this because this is an issue that has come up for, for some clients and others that I've talked to is suppose you don't have um, much or any payroll right now because you have, um, you know, you've, you've furloughed employees, there's just simply no demand for your goods and services at the moment. Um, and let's say you get a loan of, you know, a million dollars or $600,000 or whatever the amount might be. Um, can you use up to 25% for, um, for non-payroll costs, or do you have to wait until you have payroll costs to, to spend on other things? Suhas, do you have a, a view on that? Yeah, I believe when, when, when it's a question of, of using the proceeds, I'm gonna differentiate between using the proceeds versus forgiveness of the loan, okay? At the time of mm -hmm. using the proceeds, I believe you can still use 25% of the proceeds for non-payroll qualifying costs like rent and mortgage interest and as such, okay? But on the tail end, when you're trying to get forgiveness, I believe you will not get any of it forgiven because you, because uh, when it comes to calculation of forgiveness, your non-payroll costs cannot exceed 33% uh, of your uh, loan that is forgiven for payroll purposes. So if you don't have payroll uh, cost, then none of your loan is forgiven for payroll purposes. And because the loan that is not, because the loan, there is zero loan that is being forgiven for payroll purposes, 25% uh, of zero is still, 33% uh, of zero is still a zero. Right, right. That's, that's how I view it as well. I, I do have a little bit of a concern that the SBA might say that, you know, because the predominant purpose of these loans is payroll, that you have to spend um, at least a certain percentage or amount on, on payroll, and that if you, um, if you don't have any payroll spending, that even forgiveness aside, that any 
use of the funds for non-payroll costs uh, creates a problem. That's, we don't have guidance to that effect yet, but it's, it's just something that has been sort of a, a concern of mine given the way this is developed. Um, like you, if we I, can go I to think, the I, I think uh, like you said, a lot, lot of uh, stuff scares Act is is a kind of very uh, fluid. From day to day, things are changing. So whatever you and I are saying today might change tomorrow based on guidance, you know? Right, right. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So, and, and this is why it becomes, you know, such a, such a, a, a difficult judgment call for borrowers is that, um, you know, there are penalties for misusing loan funds, um, including, you know, there's, there's fraud penalties potentially if you, you know, make a, uh, you know, a, a, I suppose a knowing misstatement on your application. Um, the Treasury Secretary said, I think yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, that he would be open to pursuing criminal liability against borrowers that, um, you know, sort of egregiously apply for loans that, um, that they Um, some of you who are listening may have seen that, you know, in, over the past week or so, there have been a number of pretty high-profile companies that have uh, been revealed as uh, recipients of these loans that were either publicly traded companies, um, private equity-owned companies, companies owned by uh, billionaires. Um, you know, some of the examples that we've seen of companies that have received and then sort of been in almost shamed into repaying their loans were um, the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, Shake Shack, Potbellies, uh, Roops Chris. Um, and, you know, to be clear, I, I, it would seem to me that they were all eligible to apply under the guidance that existed at that time. But I think because of the outcry, um, you know, we've now gotten guidance that says basically there's a certification on the loan application that says this loan is, you know, given the current economic uncertainty, this loan is necessary to support uh, the operations of the business. And the most recent guidance we have from the SBA is that, you know, a, a public company and even many private companies may not be eligible or may not be able, rather, to make that certification uh, in good faith. And in fact, just earlier today, um, the SBA said that they would publish additional guidance on eligibility and under what circumstances a, an applicant may or may not make that certification, uh, but we don't have that yet. Uh, and hopefully we'll have it soon because there is a deadline of May 7th to return loan funds that have been received. There's, it's kind of a, a safe harbor. If you return it by May 7th, then the SBA will presume you made the certification in good faith. Um, so obviously, as that date gets closer, um, we're very hopeful that there'll be more guidance as to, um, you know, who, who is and is not eligible. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk next about um, how much of a loan is eligible for forgiveness. Obviously, the, um, the most attractive feature of these loans for many, if not most borrowers, is that they are forgivable um, and, the, and the forgiveness amount is excluded from borrowers' uh, gross income. You know, the, the ordinary rule is that if you have a debt forgiven, you have to take that into account as income. Here, that's not the case. So it really, truly is uh, free money um, for those who are eligible for it. So if we can go to the next slide. Sue House, were you gonna add something? No, no, you're good. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Um, so, you know, in general, up to the full amount of the loan and accrued interest uh, is eligible for forgiveness. Um, as I said a moment ago, it's, it's excluded from gross income. Um, but then the actual amount of forgiveness generally is gonna depend on how much the borrower is able to spend during the eight week period that begins on the date of the first loan uh, disbursement. So, and, and in fact, that the SBA just clarified, I think, within the past few days, that these loans should all be dispersed in a single payment. Um, 
and to the extent that any lenders are not doing that, they, they need to do that. The eight week period begins on the date that that first payment or, or the entire payment is dispersed and amounts spent after that period, while they might be allowable uses of loan funds will not qualify for forgiveness. So there is really a premium on spending within that eight week period. And I think we'll talk about in a few minutes, kind of uh, some strategies or options or things that you can do to potentially increase that amount. If we can move to the next slide. So the, the kinds of items that are eligible for forgiveness, um, if they're, the statute uses the phrase, um, costs incurred and payments made during the covered period for payroll costs, um, payments of mortgage interest on mortgages that were incurred before February 15, rent payments under leases entered into before February 15, and utility payments under utility service agreements entered into before February 15. So notice this is a bit narrower and more specific than, um, than the permissible uses of, of loan funds. Um, Aaron, if we can go to the next slide. So the, the example would be, you know, if you use your loan proceeds to pay rent under a lease entered into after February 15th, um, or if you use it to pay interest on other debt, that, those are allowable uses, but they are not uh, forgivable. And then as we saw with, with the use of the loan proceeds generally, at least 75% of the forgiveness amount must consist of eligible payroll costs. And Suhas, I don't know if you wanted to address this, but um, this was, you know, there's obviously this, this is where it does seem a bit clearer that in order to get any forgiveness, you have to spend on payroll. Exactly. 75% of the, of, the, of the forgiveness portion also has to be for payroll cost purposes. Correct. So, and, and so the way I understand it is, for example, if you spend, um, let's say you have a loan of $900,000 and you spend 600,000 on payroll costs and you spend the remaining 300,000 on non-payroll costs, I, as I understand it, no more than 200,000 of the non-payroll costs are forgivable because that's an amount that would correspond to, to 25%. Right, that is the, the easiest way is to first find out how much of your payroll cost will qualify for, for forgiveness. And once you find out that amount, then if, you're, if you multiply that number by 33%, then that's the maximum amount of non-payroll cost that will be forgivable. Because if you take the, the payroll cost that was eligible and then take this 33% of non-payroll cost, 33% um, of the payroll uh, forgiveness, that will add up the non-payroll cost automatically, automatically will become 25% of the total forgiveness. Right. And I know that um, uh, there's, there's the, the payroll costs, you know, we could probably do a one hour webinar just in and of itself on, on how you calculate those payroll costs. But, you know, generally they take into account you know, salary and wages that you pay to employees during that eight week covered period to the extent they don't exceed $100,000 per employee. So what SBA has said that you have to do is you take basically 850 seconds, you know, eight weeks out of 52 weeks, you multiply that by 100,000 and you get uh, 15,385. So that is the maximum amount you can spend per employee during the covered period. Amounts in excess of that are not eligible for forgiveness. And in fact, I, I don't even think they're payroll costs in the first place. Um, however, you can spend amounts over and above that on covered benefits, which are still a payroll cost. So costs of health insurance, costs uh, the employer's contribution to retirement funds, the employer's share of um, state unemployment insurance, and things like that. Um, and I think, Suhas, uh, you and I talked a couple of days ago, and, and you had an interesting comment about 
the meaning of sort of paid or incurred, or, or, or paid and incurred, I should say, as it yes. relates to if you had payroll that straddles a couple of weeks or a, a, a period. Right. So, Ivan, uh, why don't we get to the tail end? And I, uh, I would like to kind of expand more on what is, what is the definition of compensation and wages. I already see some questions regarding that on the chat. And also, I right. can ex explain in detail what incurred and payment means under CARES Act. Sure, sure. So the, the question that I see that came in just a moment ago is, does that include independent contractors? And the answer to that is pretty clearly no. Um, the SBA has said that amounts you pay to independent contractors are not taken into account in, in determining payroll, nor are they taken into account um, as sort of a, as an allowable uh, cost for purposes of forgiveness or otherwise. Um, however, and it, and it may be almost moot at this point, because I, as I said, I, I believe the loan funds are likely uh, almost all gone, but in many instances, independent contractors or self-employed people may apply for, for their own uh, paycheck protection loans to replace their own compensation at least up to $100,000 a year. Um, Aaron, why don't we move to uh, the next slide? Um, and this has to do with, there's a complicated set of calculations that effectively what they do is they, they cause your forgiveness amount to be automatically reduced if you have either um, cut uh, headcount or cut uh, full-time equivalent employees um, during certain periods, or if you've reduced the salaries of certain employees. So the way that it works mathematically is borrowers have to calculate what is their full-time equivalent uh, employment during the covered period, which again, that's the eight week period that starts on the date you get your loan. And then they divide that by the number of um, full-time equivalent employees between either, and the borrower can choose which, which time period it wants to use, either February 15 and June 30 of last year, or between January 1st and February 29th of this year. So for example, if you had um, 90 full-time equivalent employees during the covered period, 100 full-time equivalent employees during the testing period, uh, that's a ratio of, of 90%. If your forgiveness amount, let's say, was otherwise $1 million, your forgiveness amount would automatically be reduced to um, uh, to nine hundred thousand um, dollars. Let's go to the next slide, and then I'll um, I want to address. So this other one, there, there's also a provision um, that causes you to have a reduction in forgiveness amount to the extent that any reduction in salary or wages that's paid to an employee generally who earned less than $100,000 in 2019, um, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's sort of the general rule. Um, to the extent that their uh, compensation or wages has, that, it, that the reduction exceeds 25% of the total that was paid to that person during the last full quarter. Now, this is an issue that I think a lot of people uh, are, are kind of, scratching their heads over because the way the statute is written, it, it literally seems to say that you have to compare the amount that these employees earned in eight weeks to what they earned in the prior 13 weeks, uh, one calendar quarter, and if it's more than 25% less, you have to reduce the, um, you have to reduce the, the forgiveness amount by whatever that excess is. Um, that, that is what the statute literally seems to say uh, we're waiting for SBA guidance on that, but my, you know, my view of it at least, uh, for whatever it's worth, is that has to be an error in the statute because even if you kept employee salaries exactly the same, for that matter, even if you gave every employee a slight increase in pay, because you're comparing an eight-week period to a 13-week period, they will necessarily earn more than 25% less in eight weeks 
than they earned in 13. So I have to believe that that would be a, um, that, that that's just an error, but we've yet to get guidance from uh, the SBA on how they will uh, interpret that. I don't know, Suhas, if you've seen anything, you know, since we talked yeah. about this several days ago on, on that calculation. So our view is that you would take the 13 week payroll and divide it by 13 multiplied by eight and then do the comparison. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're, you're right. This is right now. It's, it's anybody's interpretation. So this is our interpretation because that's what makes sense. That's, that's the fair way. Otherwise, if you're comparing 13 week salary to eight week salary, nobody will be able to make it, you know? Right. Right, exactly. I mean, it's it's literally it's an apples to oranges comparison. Absolutely. And if you if you're comparing eight to thirteen, as I said, it, it it will always be it will it will always be less and will always be pretty significantly yep. less. Um, exactly. So um, the work the, there, the work there book, are, the work book that we created. That's how we did it. We divide we are dividing thirteen weeks of payroll by eight by you know and coming up with a weekly number and then multiplying it by eight weeks. And then we are doing the comparison, at least in our workbook that we have created. Right. And I mean, intuitively, I think that's the result that makes the most sense to everybody who's, who's really sat and thought about it. But you, you then have the problem that the statute does literally seem to say that this, that no, this is how you do it. And I, I know I've talked to, at least a couple of people that say, well, until we get guidance, you know, we're just going to follow the statute, which, which seems yeah. wrong and they acknowledged as much, but it's a, it's a crazy result. Yep. Um, there are a couple of questions I see relating to um, union dues and whether or not, um, pay, you know, either union dues or union payments are included as a payroll cost. Um, my, my understanding of it, or, or at least my best sort of educated guess, is that um, contributions to like a union pension plan, for example, should be included as part of payroll costs. I don't know whether, um, you know, union dues generally um, are, are includable. They, they might be includable as gross wages um, to the extent they come out of employees' pay, but I don't know, and, and I don't know, Suhas, if you have a view on that either. Right, so this is where I think I see a couple of questions and ultimately my, the compensation that is defined in CARES Act is the gross cash wages in a sense, gross compensation, okay? Before any deduction uh, that could affect uh, the taxability of that compensation. So our view is that it's a gross compensation uh, before 401k a deduction and before section 125 deduction. Now. In case of a union company, if those dues that are being taken out of employees' paycheck are not taxable, then they would be part of compensation. If they are, uh, if they are taxable, then they would not be part of compensation. But if they are not taxable, then they would be part of compensation. And I agree with you, employer's share of contribution towards health care, retirement, pension would be on top of it as considered payroll cost. So it, so it sounds like what you're saying is that sort of one way or the other, whether it's included as, you know, the gro in an employee's gross wages right. or whether it's considered um, an employer's contribution to retirement or, or maybe health benefits or other benefits, that it would seem like in most instances, although perhaps not all, that it will be uh, included. That's right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so, so to give you an example, and I was going to give this example was, let's say uh, $1,000 is, is your pay rate, and then uh, out of that, if, uh, if Section 125 deduction or 401k deduction is reducing your, your salary from, from $1,000 to $700, then for the, for the purpose of loan forgiveness, $1,000 compensation is considered the payroll cost, okay? So either I can take seven, uh, I can take thousand dollars, or I can take seven hundred and then add back those those, de those uh, uh, retirement deductions and and healthcare deduction as my payroll cost. So one way or another, it still comes to the same number. That's correct. 
That's correct. Although the interesting thing is that it's um, the if it's part of an employee's gross wages, then it's only includable up to that fifteen thousand three eighty five limit. However, right. if it's an employer funded benefit, it, it gets included above that limit potentially. So that's where, that's right. in some ways, um, you know, if it is like an employer contribution to retirement or a 401k or a pension, it's, you know, marginally more helpful um, uh, because it, it's taken into account kind of above that uh, limit. And in fact, we, we just got a question about this as to whether um, health insurance is a payroll cost, but is it subject to the $100,000 limit? And I think the answer to that is no. So if you suppose you have an employee who earns $15,385 during the covered period, but then you also contribute $2,000 to, um, you know, to, to that employee's health care or, or, or health insurance premiums, then that gets taken into account uh, in addition. Um, so, Ivan, Ivan if, I, if I may add, add to, to clarify, employers, employers' net contribution to health insurance and retirement is 100% covered. It, it is not subject to the 100,000 limit. But, but when it right. comes to empl employees, employees' contribution to retirement or, or health insurance, you have to take that in, into consideration for the 100,000 limit. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I also see there's a question about um, if new employees are hired during the eight-week period, are there wages allowed to be included in the forgiveness? That, that's a great question, and here's how I understand it. So you, when you apply for and receive a loan, you're, you apply for um, a, a certain amount that's based on, it's two and a half times your average monthly payroll from the prior year. And then you have eight weeks within which to pay that money to um, employees during, during the covered period. Um, to, as far as I know, there, there is no um, tracking per se as to employees, so you don't have to be necessarily paying the same people. And in fact, you know, there in many businesses, uh, there obviously is turnover to where some of the people that you're paying during the covered period are probably not the same people that you were paying during, you know, last year. But, you know, sort of all, all things being equal, your your loan amount is only going to be up to the extent of two and a half times your average payroll for last year. So if your payroll has actually increased relative to last year, there may not be enough uh, money available to pay um, to pay uh, workers um, during the eight week period. So uh, do you do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, just, um, uh, Ivan, there's a question here whether auto allowance is considered a part of payroll cost, and my answer is if the auto allowance is a part of the W-2, has been included in the W-2, and then it becomes a part of compensation, and then that auto allowance would be part of that 100,000 limitation. I agree with that. I agree with that. And for that matter, I don't know that it necessarily um, – applies uh, to, I, I'm not sure whether it applies to anyone who's listening today, but I think the same would be true for housing allowances. As a matter of fact, yep. I think um, SBA answered that specifically. If you have an employee and in addition to compensation, you pay that person a housing allowance, you know, that's presumably taken into account as part of their income uh, and, and it um, you know, goes into wages, goes into the payroll costs. Subject, of course, to if they're over the limit and it's a, and it's a cash, you know, stipend of, of so much per month for housing, um, then it may not be included if, if they're over the limit. Um, I, I wanted to um, just get back to the slides. Um, so the last couple of slides on, on, or the last couple of bullet points on this particular slide talks about um, there. So I mentioned earlier that you know there's sort of the forgiveness amount. And then there is the reduction in forgiveness amount that occurs if there's been either a reduction in headcount or a reduction in um, uh, 
uh, salaries of, of employees. Um, there's also an exception to the exception, and that provides that if any reduction in, in full-time equivalent employees and if any reduction in uh, salaries has been eliminated, uh, or, or excuse me, if it occurred between February 15 and April 26 of this year, so presumably you know, in response to sort of the most acute effects of the pandemic, and then that reduction is eliminated on or before June 30th, there is no automatic reduction in, um, in, in the forgiveness amount. However, you still have to keep in mind that, as, I, as I've said a few times, the money still has to have been paid out uh, during the covered period. So if there's been a significant enough reduction, let's say in headcount, um, an employer may not be able to pay enough in payroll costs during the eight week period if, for example, it's, it's not, um, it's eliminating the reduction, but not until say June 30th or, 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 or late in June. Um, so it's, it becomes, even where there's not an automatic reduction, it can become something of a, of a math problem. Correct. Uh, if I may, Ivan, this, this, this part of the act is the most troublesome and, and the guidance is very poor. Uh, what I call restoration of reduction in forgiveness, okay? There are two instances where you can restore it back, but when you, as a practical proposition, if you try to do the calculation, it is very hard to do that calculation because there is no guidance. To give an example, it talks about FT. You have to do a comparison of FTs as of February 15, and then do comparison of FTs at April 26. Now, there's a difference. If you talk about head counts, I can do a head count as of a particular date. But how do I do a FT calculation of a particular date? And it stumps me. It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm really confused as to how, how do I even calculate that. And from what I've heard, there's a lot of guidance that is required for the restoration of the reduction of this credit, of, of this uh, amount, okay? Right, I agree, I agree. It, it's sort of, it's one of those things that um, you and I talked about recently in preparing for this webinar and just the whole, notion of, of, you know, it seems to make sense on, on its face that, okay, you have to eliminate the reduction, uh, but then what does it mean to eliminate, how can you have an FTE calculation as of a particular date? It, by definition, has to be over some period of time. And whether that exactly. just means the immediately preceding pay period, whether it means the preceding month, whether it means some other period is, 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 is totally unclear at this time. And similarly, when it comes to restoration of, 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 the, of, the, of the salary or wages back to, to uh, April, uh, February 25th, I don't understand what they, is it, do you have to restore somebody's rate or are you restoring, how, do you, how else do you restore it? If I can understand if a person is making $5,000 a week, I'm just making this up, and they have been given a 50% haircut. And if the law says, you need to bring that person's salary back to 5,000. I can understand that, but that's not how the, the act has, the law has been written. And so it's very hard to figure out how do I eliminate the reduction in the salary, you know? Right, right, exactly. Does it mean you have to restore them as of June 30, or does it mean you actually have to give them back pay for whatever exactly. period of time they were reduced? So, and, and, also, um, and, also, and also in case of hourly, hourly employees, it's very hard to figure it out because you know you may have you may have been giving somebody a twenty twenty dollar an hour rate before February fifteen, okay, and but but they were working uh, twenty hours. Um, let's say they were working thirty hours. Uh, one way of restoring it is to and, and now the pay, payroll has been cut from twenty bucks an hour to ten bucks. But I can always uh, raise it to twenty bucks, but reduce the hours. So I think. There are a lot of ways it's very confusing how do you restore somebody's paycheck on an, especially on an hourly uh, employee, okay? Right, right. Um, if we could go to the next slide, Aaron. Um, okay, so I wanna talk next, and let's, let's go one further actually. Um, 
So I want to talk next about what are the mechanics of applying for, for forgiveness. And this, I think, has really taken on new importance really in the last couple of days as we've gotten some additional guidance, as I mentioned, about who you know, may or may not be eligible for um, not only forgiveness, but for a loan in the first place. So the borrower is required to seek forgiveness uh, of a loan by submitting an application to the lender that includes documents to verify the number of full-time equivalent employees. These include um, things like you know, their uh, federal payroll tax filings, state you know, income payroll or, or unemployment filings, um, and then documentation like canceled checks or bank records or other proof that the amounts actually were paid uh, during the covered period and, and, and relate to the covered period. And Sue House will talk about that in, in a few moments about this whole concept of what it means to be both paid and incurred. Um, if we could go to the next slide though, where, um, you know, and then the borrower has to certify that the information is true and correct, the amount for which forgiveness is requested was used to retain employees, make interest payments, uh, and make payments on, on covered rent obligations or covered mortgages, essentially that it was all used for allowable uh, purposes. Um, if we could go to the next slide, the, um, the, so lenders who receive this forgiveness application have to issue a decision uh, within 60 days. Um, however, SBA announced today that any loan in excess of $2 million, the SBA will be reviewing uh, the forgiveness application before uh, forgiveness can be, can be approved. Um, you know, again, I think there's probably some amount of, of them reacting to some negative publicity about companies that, you know, while, while perhaps um, technically eligible, seemingly are, are in violation of, of, of at least the spirit of the law and maybe that certification if they have, um, you know, ready access to cash or to credit or to capital such that, you know, they, they really cannot certify that the, the money is necessary to support their ongoing operations. Um, and then, you know, there is, um, there is no, at least as far as I'm aware, there's no, you know, official deadline for borrowers to submit a forgiveness application. For that matter, I don't even know that you ever are required to apply for forgiveness but, but presumably most borrowers would like it um, because it's a huge benefit. And, you know, I think our advice would be, you know, apply as quickly as you're able to ensure that, um, you know, you have all the necessary documents and that, and that the process can, can go as, as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Um, Aaron, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, and then the, the last couple of slides before I turn it over to Suhas to talk about some of these uh, payroll issues is um, just speaks to what happens to a balance that is not forgiven. And in many instances, um, there will be amounts that are not forgiven, either because um, borrowers, you know, their, their payroll has gone down since, um, since applying for the loan, such that they're not able to spend all the money, or because they have to spend it all in eight weeks, they're unable to, um, you know, remember that the loan amount is two and a half times monthly payroll, but they're essentially having to spend it all in eight weeks. And so you may have situations where, you know, for a variety of reasons, borrowers maybe don't have the rent or mortgage or utility expenses to support the full loan amount. Um, and so you may have some, uh, some amount that is unforgiven at the end of the period. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, so any balance that remains at the end of the period is um, it uh, has to be repaid over two years at 1% interest. There is an automatic six month deferral so that borrowers are not required to pay anything for six months from the date of loan disbursement. And then interest continues to accrue. And after six months, the borrower has, uh, you know, the remaining 18 months within which to repay interest in principal. So, Aaron, if you want to go to the next slide, and I think, I, I, yeah, I think I, now, Ivan, can I add one? This also the loan that is not yes. forgiven. 
the loan, the amount of proceeds that you receive that are not for, for, forgiven, you again, I want to emphasize that they can be used in future only for expenses that CARES Act allows, right? It cannot be just used for anything but those expenses, right? Correct. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. And I think I said that, that earlier, uh, if, yes. if I didn't, I should have, that regardless of even if you are not concerned about forgiveness amount or even if you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to repay some of this, you still are limited to spending. 75% has to be spent for payroll and the balance can only be spent for those, you know, defined um, purposes, Expenses. mortgage interest, yep. rent, utilities, et cetera. Okay, so now we are on my slide. It's really just a heading, and um, I just wanted to be very clear, and there have been a lot of questions about what, what does a compensation mean. So, so one of the main costs that is eligible for PPP loan forgiveness is the payroll cost of the borrower. Now, payroll cost, among other things, the big element of the, of the of payroll cost is the, is the cash compensation that an employer pays to the employees for salaries, wages, and tips. With regards to these salaries and wages and tips, uh, CARES Act, for the CARES Act purposes, compensation means gross compensation. I'm, I'm repeating myself because it's, uh, make sure we, we all understand, it's not taxable wages, it's not Medicare wages, it's not social, social security taxable wages. It's a gross compensation. And gross compensation, as I, told, I, I mentioned, is a, is a compensation before reduction of employees' contribution to 401k, before uh, employees' contribution to Section 125 health care benefits or whatever. So if you take an example, if an employee has a salary of 1000 if an employee is getting paid at a rate of $1,000 per week, but from that $1,000, if he contributes $200 for 401k and $100 for Section 125, then taxable wages are only $700. In this situation, for the purpose of payroll, for payroll cost for CARES Act, the cost is $1,000, not $700, and I want to make sure that we are clear about that. Second uh, thing, the second uh, point that I want to bring to attention is this limit of $100,000. So when you are calculating the payroll forgiveness, uh, for, uh, forgiveness of loan for payroll purposes, we have to make sure that forgiveness per employee cannot exceed in excess of 100,000 of that employee's annual, annualized wages. In other words, if the salary on a weekly basis is in excess of $1,923 per employee, then any excess above 1923 is ignored for, for loan forgiveness purposes. Similarly, any amount that an employer pays on a bi-weekly bi cycle and any amount that is paid to an employee in any pay period in that eight week in excess of 3,846 would, would not qualify. Again, any excess over 4,166 in a bi-monthly cycle would be ignored. And in case of a monthly cycle, any amount paid in excess of 8,333 would be ignored. So uh, we have to be careful when you're calculating the loan forgiveness that how the 100,000 limit is calculated. Next slide, uh, Aaron. And, and, and I'm now addressing one of the most confusing, but I understand why this was done. The most confusing part of the act is the concept is that an employer is uh, the expenses that qualifying expenses that an employer incurs and pays within the eight week period are the only expenses that can be forgiven. So the CARES Act has introduced this concept of incurred and paid. I understand why I, the, the purpose or objective behind this terminology incurred and paid is to stop, I believe, it, employers from abusing the provisions of the loan forgiveness. So let's explore what this cost incurred and payments made during the covered period seems a little bit confusing and vague, but an ent we all know in a, in a business setting, an entity may incur expenses, but, it, but may pay it on, at a later date. 
which, which, which all accountants call it accrued expenses. On the other hand, an entity may pay expenses before they are due, they have not been incurred, what we call prepaid expenses. Rarely a business pays, incurs the expense and pays it at the same time. Right now, there is very little guidance about how to exactly, it is very hard to determine uh, expenses incurred and paid within eight, eight week period. As an abandoned caution, we, would suge we suggest taking the most stringent and literal definition while calculating a qualified expenses which are considered paid and incurred in eight week period. For example, I'll give you an example of a, of a payroll, okay? If an employer in the eight week covered period, the eight week period covered starts on April 15th and, and, and then runs a payroll, okay? On April 17th, and the April, April 17th payroll runs for the period of April 11th through April 17th. In this case, you cannot take the entire payroll as a qualifying expense. You would have to take proportionate payroll from date when the loan was received, which is April 15th through April 17th, and only those three of the five days of payroll would be considered qualified expense. So date paid is not, not only you have to pay the expense in the, in the eight week covered period, but that expense has to be incurred in that covered period. Conversely, it can also happen that last day of your eight week may straddle a, a, a payroll. In that situation, if the payroll is paid outside the, the last day of eight week payroll, uh, eight week, then it will not qualify. So you have to make sure when your eight weeks are ending to have a short payroll run that ends on the last day of eight week. That way you have not only incurred that expense, but you also paid it within eight months in, in the eight week period. Same strategies you may have to use for non-payroll costs like rent and electricity um, is to make sure that expenses that are incurred in that eight week period are paid within the same period. So for example, it may happen that you may have a rent that, that you incurred during eight week period but might not be due to the, might not be due before the last day of the eight week. In that situation, either you make a proportionate payment of your rent before the eight week period or prepay the whole rent. And then for your calculation of loan forgiveness, you may just take a proportionate amount that falls within your eight week period for forgiveness. So I just want to make sure that people are cognizant of when calculating loan forgiveness, that all expenses have to be incurred within those eight week period and make sure that they have been paid in those eight week period. And sometimes we have to use uh, creative strategies to, to pay them. Right, I, I think that's such a great point to us because they're really, you know, early on, I had heard some suggestions about, you know, if, if someone really found themselves with sort of excess cash, you know, could you prepay six months of rent or could you prepay uh, six months of uh, utilities? And I think, you know, the, the, probably the, the answer to that based on the words of the statute is, is no. And I, I think that's also the result that would be sort of most consistent with the purpose of the statute. Um, yep. The purpose of the statute clearly is to help employers get some kind of relief during the most acute stage of, of the pandemic. And I don't think that the purpose of these loans uh, is to allow people to, you know, prepay expenses and, and so forth. And so you know, I, I would think that, um, you know, that's not only, is, I, I, I think your reading of it is, is the correct one. And I think that SBA would likely take, um, you know, a, a kind of a dim view of, of people that are using these loan funds to make uh, prepayments. And in fact, I, there is some guidance, uh, not quite the same context, but they do say in relation to like employees in one instance, I think they say that, you know, the purpose of these loans is not for businesses to expand, but rather to maintain their their employees. And I think and, and, maybe and, and, there's, and there's some... Yeah. Um, so we've got, um, 
we've got a, a, a few minutes left. Um, I want to just answer a couple of questions that have uh, come up in the chat and uh, try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, one is, um, so one, and I think this one is pretty straightforward. Are the dates determined by when the funds hit your account or do you select the eight week period? Um, and I think the answer to that is the eight week period begins on the date that the funds hit your account. So if the funds hit your account, um, well, whatever day, uh, if it's today, your eight week period would begin uh, today. Ivan, there's a question here about, about uh, restoration of uh, uh, forgiveness uh, if the employee head count is brought up. And the question seems to, at least the way I understand this question is, do we have to bring up all, uh, FTE of less than 100K employee? No. When it comes to the to FTE head count, and if you want to not get a, not have the reduction in your forgiveness, it doesn't matter whether the employee earned 100K or less than 100K. The 100K or less than 100K applies only in case of a salary reduction, not in case of head count reduction. Do you agree? That's correct. I, I don't think you, Right? I, I do. I do. Um, the only thing, and, and I would honestly have to sort of think through how the math works, it, it strikes me that um, while it could, it could affect FTE, um, because payroll costs only include compensation up to $100,000, um, you may have, like, if there's a Reduc let, let's say there's um, a reduction of someone who's earning um, substantially more than $100,000. It shouldn't affect your ability to uh, use the full amount of the loan, except to the extent of maybe 15000 for that particular person. Right. My, my, my point being, when it comes to comparing FT count before February, before eight-week period and after eight-week period, it doesn't matter. FT is FT, whether whether some of the FTs make more than hundred thousand and some of the FTs make less than hundred thousand. When it is a comparison right. of FT, uh, the act doesn't differentiate between FTs making over hundred thousand and FT making less than hundred thousand. When you are trying to do FT comparison during eight week period with some other period, you know. Right, and and in fact, you know, as to the salary reduction, I had um, I've read just in the news, a couple of examples of companies that are um, reducing the salaries of their executives who are making, you know, well over $100,000. And I think, you know, you can, you know, sort of, despite some of the questions about how you calculate the reduction for people who are under, I think you can, you can certainly reduce the salaries of employees earning over $100,000 by almost any amount that you want without having it um, affect forgiveness amount. And I think that's, um, you know, in some instances, that's sort of an admirable thing that some businesses have done to, in order to protect um, their, you know, lower and, and sort of moderate income uh, employees. There's another question here, here which says whether workers' comp insurance payments are considered payroll costs. My reading, I have not seen anywhere which allows workers' comp insurance, employers' cost of workers' comp insurance to be considered payroll cost. I don't think that would qualify for payroll forgiveness or even a proper use of PPP funds. I, I agree. Um, I mean, I'll say that I don't think there's any guidance on that, but I, I think that um, you're, you're likely right about that. And maybe sort of along similar lines, there's a question about whether Fuel for company vehicles or company equipment, would that be included as a utility expense? The, um, the CARES Act, I, I don't have the statute right in front of me, but I believe the phrase is something like, you know, uh, you, they define a utility as like cost for the service of a distribution of gas, electricity, transportation, water, um, internet, and telephone service. And apologies if I've left anything out because I don't have it right in front of me. But so I, I would think that fuel for a vehicle um, would likely not qualify. Um, frankly, I, 
I, I have to say, I, I still don't understand what it means to have, uh, you know, the, the service of distribution of transportation. I'm not sure what that would be referring to, but it doesn't seem like on its face, like it would necessarily include, um, you know, gas for a, for a vehicle. Right. So tra that's one term in uh, transportation. I'm not able to figure out what what the act means by transportation. Okay, how is that considered utility? I don't know. You know. Right, right. Um, the question that just came in a moment ago about um, does our um, uh, our bonuses considered a payroll cost? And I think the answer is is yes, provided they are both paid and incurred during the covered period. And of course you can't uh, exceed $15,385 per uh, employee for that period. Um, so here's, here's, a, here's an interesting question that is posted. I think my opinion, I wanna make sure you are in agreement with me. If during eight week period, if you end up paying for performance bonus of the, of the previous, uh, for, for the period before eight weeks, you may have paid that bonus within that eight week period, okay, for the performance, but the performance that the employee rendered to the company was period before eight weeks, then I don't know how I can consider that as an incurred within eight week period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a really great point. I mean, I think you, um, I think you would almost have to, um, you know, be very careful as to how you described the bonus. Um, you could say, right, for example, right. that it's a bonus for performance during the covered period. But I think you're probably yep. right if you said, we're gonna pay you a bonus in May for your performance during 2019, I think that's not uh, a cost incurred or a payment made in, uh, it, you know, during the covered period. Although, you know, I, I think there's, it's just probably could be some debate about it. Um, I want to take one additional question, um, and I, I, Suhas, I don't know if you know the answer because I'm not sure that I do, but someone asked uh -huh. whether rent would include um, rental of equipment. Um, I've had a similar question uh, come up in, in passing with um, uh, a client earlier, and you know, the statute, is, to the best of my recollection, it just refers to um, rent. I don't know that it necessarily uh, would have to be rent of a, um, uh, you know, of a, of a premises. Um, right. That's kind of how I read it, but I don't know that there's a clear answer to that. I think, I think if a literal reading of the, of the act, it just says any, any lease, any lease that you may have paid that you may have already entered into leasing agreement before February 15th. So if I take that meaning and there is no other guidance, then I would say that the rent of any kind, if the agreement is before the date, should qualify. Mm -hmm. But again, right. this is right now because there's no guidance, so this is the, the, I'm going by the literal meaning, strict meaning of well, reading the act the way it is written, you know? Right, and certainly you could imagine a business where renting equipment might be as important or even more important than renting a, a, a premises. Um, so, right. but but that being said, I, I don't know that there's a clear answer to it at this time. That's right. So, um, we I think we are we are out of time. Um, you see on uh, your screens, I, I think our um, emails are displayed and telephone numbers. Um, feel free to contact either one of us uh, with any questions um, about this program or, or other uh, aspects of uh, relief under the CARES Act. Um, as I said at the beginning, the uh, materials for this presentation and a recording should be posted um, uh, in about uh, a day and, and you should all receive an email related to that. And then finally, um, uh, Suhas and I are gonna be talking again next week. We're gonna be doing an, another webinar talking about the um, uh, Main Street um, Lending Program. It's a program of the Treasury Department and um, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve for lending to businesses, including incidentally uh, businesses that already have PPP loans. It's apparently not a mutually exclusive program. So 
Um, as I said, please feel free to reach out to us with questions. Uh, hope to see some of you here next week. And uh, thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Evan.